afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't have anything off the top, so um, Leon, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Uh, well, for a change, let me start with North Korea, if, sure. if I may. Um, yesterday, you said that you were not in a position to confirm reports or the accuracy of reports of uh, North Korean troops in Russia mobilizing potentially for the war in Ukraine. North Korea has denied it. Um, do you have any new information on that, a new assessment uh, today? To I don't us? have anything new to, to offer on that, Leon. We are uh, continuing to look into the reports that uh, the DPRK has sent soldiers to fight alongside Russia. Um, if it's true uh, that DPRK soldiers are joining uh, Putin's war against Ukraine, it certainly would mark a dangerous and highly concerning development. Uh, as it relates to this, we are, of course, going to continue to consult with our allies and partners on the implications of such a dramatic move. Uh, certainly, if true, it would be another um, reckless and dangerous action, uh, both on the side of Russia, but of course on the side of the DPRK as well. But I, I don't, I'm not in a place to offer any uh, uh, formal assessment or confirmation from uh, the United States today. Okay, but ju ju just to uh, cover uh, the. Obviously, the South Koreans have been pretty specific on, on this uh, with numbers and a lot of information. I'm sure they've shared that information with you. Um, do you not have yet confidence in uh, South Korean intel? So, uh, Leon, it's not at all about uh, confidence uh, at all. Of course, we have a close and important partnership relationship with our uh, uh, ROK partners. Uh, it is important, of course, that the, there, these are, there are deliberative processes as it relates to these kinds of things. When we are speaking on behalf of the United States, and certainly when I'm up here as a U.S. official speaking on these things, we want to make sure to have uh, the most up-to-date and accurate assessment to offer you. Uh, and what I can say right now is echoing what I said yesterday is that we are continuing to look into those reports. Uh, the most important thing, though, is that we are going to continue to consult with our allies and partners on the implications of such a dramatic move, but I don't have any um, uh, new updated information to, to offer on that. Can I follow up? Nike, Nike, go ahead. I, I will get to you guys. Go ahead. Follow on Leon's good yeah. questions. Uh, so South Korea said it will consider uh, providing Ukraine with weapons for defense and attack. Would you like to comment? So look, I, I would defer to the Republic of Korea to speak to its own uh, issues regarding its security assistance to Ukraine. Uh, we, of course, welcome any country uh, supporting our Ukrainian partners as they continue to defend their territorial integrity and sovereignty. If you recall, Nike, since the onset of Russia's uh, aggression, we have rallied a coalition of more than 50 countries to, uh, uh, to Ukraine in its defense against Russia's brutal aggression, and we'll continue to work with our allies and partners to strengthen Ukrainian defense, as well as uh, build its uh, institutions and support Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Uh, the other thing that I want to note, um, uh, Nike, since you've given me the opportunity, is that this is just another um, example of how Russia's actions, Russia's dangerous actions, uh, are not just a threat to Ukrainian security or European security. They are, of course, a threat uh, to global security. When you are seeing um, countries in the Indo-Pacific and Asia region uh, also uh, making a sovereign choice to uh, support Ukraine in its defense. Is, is, is The takeaway from that, Nike, is that the whole world, not just Europe, not just NATO allies, uh, see the threat and the dangerousness and the recklessness from Russian action. Uh, yeah, South uh, Korea, Jane. sorry. Thank South Korea you. government uh, also you. said they will consider sending military intelligence personnel to Ukraine to uh, help assess the uh, battlefield tactics. I, I just also wouldn't I ha I have anything to offer on that. I would let the ROK speak to that. And of course, these are ultimately sovereign decisions for them. Jenny, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, same topic in the North Koreans mm -hmm. military uh, troops. At the House Intelligence Committee, Chairman Mike Turner sent a letter to President the Biden requesting a briefing on the North Korean military deployment. He also said that the United States and the NATO allies should respond immediately as the situation is serious 
what is the State Department's response to this? So first of all, um, certainly I'm not going to get into the weeds on uh, congressional correspondence. What I can say is that on uh, in both chambers, both the House and Senate, we have an uh, important and close working relationship, and we, of course, will continue to consult and engage with them appropriately. And in the context of these reportings, as we're um, as, as Leon asked about reports of DPRK soldiers being sent uh, to fight alongside Russian forces, we are continuing to look into that, continuing to assess uh, what's happening, and we're uh, most importantly going to continue to consult with allies and partners on the implications of such a dramatic move. And I have no doubt that when we say consulting with allies and partners, part of that, of course, means consulting with NATO allies. Secondly, uh, the South Korean government summoned the Russian ambassador to South Korea and request the immediate withdrawal of North Korean troops from Russia. It also announced that it would respond together with the international community. How does the United States agree to this, and what are the U.S.'s own countermeasures? So look, uh, this is uh, ultimately, I will let the uh, Republic of Korea speak to its own diplomatic engagements and the engagements that it might have with countries in which it has a a, a bilateral relationship. But I think what we are seeing in practice and what we're seeing is action is countries uh, making it very clear that um, it can no longer be uh, business as usual with the Russian Federation and that we are seeing uh, time and time again them taking reckless and destabilizing action them infringing on Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty, which, as I just said uh, to Nike, uh, is, of course, not just a threat to Ukrainian security and European security, but it is, of course, uh, increasingly of concern to countries in other parts of the world as well. In, in this example, uh, the Republic of Korea. Thank you. Alex, Thank you very much. just to press you a little bit more yeah. on uh, last question, uh, the British government, your I-5 ally, yesterday said that it's highly likely, quote unquote, that they are sent, North Korea is sending uh, troops uh, for Russia to fight in Ukraine. Are you telling us that they know something that you might don't, you might not know? Alex, uh, I am saying that there is a uh, process in place and there are, um, uh, it is uh, the United States, we want to be incredibly intentional and deliberate about how we uh, talk about things publicly and when we're able to be in a place to talk about things um, uh, confidently and with a certain assertion, I won't speak to what processes and other countries have in place. In the case of the United Kingdom, uh, we noted and saw their statement during the unscripted session uh, on Ukraine, uh, and I'd refer you to His Majesty's government for the UK's assessment. But as I said yesterday and just now, we are going to continue to consult with allies and partners on the implications of this um, and whether this is ends up being accurate. And we, of course, will continue to make our own assessments and look in uh, to this as well. In the meantime, we do say some progress in your definition of this. You said uh, dangerous yesterday, today you used reckless action. Uh, would that be an escalation, if true? Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, categorize it one way or the other, Alex. What we have seen, of course, is uh, uh, Russia's increasingly uh, collaboration with uh, a variety of malign actors. We have seen it earlier um, in this conflict, in the closening of relationships that we have seen as it relates to Russia and Iran. Uh, and if these, of course, reports uh, are true, it would indicate a uh, dangerous and reckless and a closening of relationships between uh, Russia and the DPRK, something that uh, would certainly not be what I would call a stabilizing factor for uh, the immediate Indo-Pacific region, but also uh, broader uh, uh, global security as well. Could we just come, Nick, back, come back to him later on? Sure. Thanks. Nick, Thanks. go ahead. Topic. Of course. Um, I want to ask about the intel leak on potential Israeli response mm -hmm. uh, plans to Iran. Uh, some Republicans yesterday and today are criticizing administration officials for saying they're deeply concerned but otherwise not taking this seriously enough. What's your response to that? And yesterday you said this topic didn't come up in any of the Secretary's bylaws now that he's in the region. 
and having bilats today is still the case. So I don't have any uh, anything to read out on the Secretary's government-to-government um, -government engagements today beyond some of the readouts that we've already uh, made public, and so I would refer you back to there. Uh, look, as it relates to the um, issues surrounding the unauthorized disclosure, I, I think many of you have seen the statement from the FBI who have indicated that they are uh, investigating this, um, that they've announced that, and I will defer to them to speak to it. Uh, certainly, we would take um, uh, any uh, unauthorized disclosure. It's something that we take very seriously, and it is, of course, in incredibly concerning. Uh, there are appropriate uh, entities of the U.S. government that are um, the appropriate authorities for these kinds of things, and we, of course, will uh, defer to them uh, when, these ha when these things happen. Uh, Simon, go ahead. Can we come to uh, Lebanon? Sure. The um, France is hosting a conference to try to make some progress on, on the issue. What is, does the U.S. sort of support the French initiative to hold this conference, and what are you hoping will be agreed there? Well, look, we, of course, are always um, eager and, and uh, to engage with uh, partners on uh, important issues, including what is currently happening in Lebanon. Uh, we will have a representation uh, at this conference. We'll hopefully be in a place to uh, announce that in the next uh, day or so, so stay tuned on that. But uh, look, when it comes to uh, the Middle East, uh, France has been a, a vital partner in continuing to marshal support for, uh, in the context of Gaza, of course, trying to get us to a ceasefire. And similarly, uh, we know that they share our goal uh, as it relates to Lebanon for creating the conditions that will allow civilians on both sides of the blue line to return to their homes. And we know that they also would like to see uh, 1701 effectively implemented. Uh, I have no doubt that a lot of these things will be talked about as well as uh, ways in which uh, participant countries in this conference can continue to support humanitarian efforts in Lebanon as well. I expect all of this to be discussed, but I don't want to get ahead of the conference. You mentioned the U.S. participation, but it's not. It hasn't been announced as part of the secretary's travel. So, do you expect? I, I don't have. I don't have any uh, uh, announcements to offer as it relates to the secretary's travel. The secretary, we expect, will will be in uh, the Middle East region as we've been talking about this whole week. Uh, but we will have participation at uh, for, at a senior level um, at the conference. Okay. So, if you if you don't send the secretary, doesn't that sort of signal uh, <clears throat> some? lesser support for this initiative? Uh, not at all. Uh, we will have senior level representation, and I will say that this is something that the Secretary himself will continue to be uh, personally engaged on. He's certainly talking about the issues surrounding Lebanon while he is on his travel. He is uh, talking about it with important counterparts and interlocutors, and um, whatever our representation ends up being looking like uh, in, in Paris, we of course uh, will be very latched up with uh, the totality of the department. And uh, again, I, I think we kind of get into this um, back and forth of whether just simply uh, present somewhere indicates any kind of prioritization, and that certainly is not the case. This is a priority for the secretary. The secretary ha is on travel in other parts of the world right now, but this is a vital issue to him, and we will make sure that there is a senior level representation from the United States at it. And if the other countries there, um, you know, specifically France, would like to see a ceasefire, your position as uh, most recently seems to be that you don't, you're not calling for an immediate ceasefire. So uh, uh, do, is this administration out of line with uh, European allies particularly, but, but allies who would like to see this, this uh, conflict come to it. There's a look, Simon. I will let uh, European allies speak for themselves, but we know that there's a convergence between us and our European allies on uh, what we all want to see, and what we all want to see ultimately is uh, the effective implementation of 1701, but more importantly, the conditions created so that civilians um, uh, can return to their homes on both sides of the blue line. And uh, perhaps even broader than that, we want to see um, uh, the country of Lebanon be able to stand on its own two feet uh, out of the stranglehold from, from Hezbollah. I am not going to speculate on what proposals and ideas may come from the conference. I think that's the purpose of these kinds of engagements, to have these important conversations in multilateral settings, and we'll let that process move forward. Jenny, go ahead. I want to ask about the Israeli strike near your hospital in southern Beirut. Does the U.S. have comment on this strike that killed more than a dozen people and left dozens more injured? 
So I've seen uh, that reporting, Jenny. I don't have any um, specifics uh, that I can offer as it relates to that operation. We, of course, will let the IDF and the Israelis speak to the kinds of operations that we're conduct that they are conducting. But uh, look, uh, we have been um, as clear as we have been that when it comes to operations that the IDF is undertaking to degrade Hezbollah, which we, of course, support, that every possible measure needs to be taken to uh, minimize impact on civilians, to minimize uh, civilian casualties, and that one step beyond that, every possible measure needs to be taken so that civilian infrastructure, whether it be hospitals, schools, anything in that uh, category, uh, that impact on that needs to be minimized as well. We have um, asked the Israelis for additional information uh, as it relates to this uh, uh, particular strike, but I don't have anything uh, to offer as it relates to that. I think let's also uh, not lose sight on the fact that Hezbollah is a a terrorist organization that does have uh, deep-rooted infrastructure in various uh, corners of uh, Lebanese society, and, and and part of that has included Hezbollah co-locating itself with civilian infrastructure. Again, as it relates to this particular hospital, I, I don't have any insight that I can offer from up here, uh, but this is something we'll continue to engage on directly with the Israelis. Will the U.S. conduct its own investigation into whether every possible measure was taken here to protect civilians? Broadly speaking, Jenny, we have uh, measures and uh, levers and processes in place to ensure that international humanitarian law um, uh, was abided by, that uh, civilian harm uh, was minimized in whatever way possible. I certainly wouldn't speak to that in these settings, and uh, I, I, we would not necessarily open our own investigation uh, at this point. Has there been any investigations into whether Israeli measures in Lebanon or Gaza have taken every possible I just wouldn't speak to uh, ongoing or deliberative processes. We have whether other any of those have wrapped up. We have talked about uh, the tools that the United States has at its disposal to do this work. Uh, basically since the onset of October 7th, I know this group is, is quite familiar with them, whether they be CHURG, whether it be uh, the Leahy process, whether, whether it be the conventional arms transfer policy and various other things. Uh, those, All of those are active, ongoing things that the United States continue to have at its disposal uh, to assess circumstances around any country in which we have a security relationship with. And that, of course, uh, is going to continue and will always be um, uh, effective implementers of, of U.S. law. Leanne, I, sorry, I, I'll pass. Okay. Can right. I just ask quickly one more? Yeah. Um, did the Secretary get any commitments from the Israeli government today that they would increase humanitarian aid to northern Gaza uh, after the letter last our, week? Our, our sec uh, the Secretary in his readout, which I know you all saw, was uh, pretty clear um, in, 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 in his readout that there are still many things and many progress markers that we need to see as it relates to the flow of humanitarian aid. Uh, I don't have any specific commitments to outline beyond what was in the readout. I, I asked because the Israelis don't make any mention of it in their own readout of that meeting. Well, look, I, I'm not a spokesperson for them. I'm a spokesperson for the U.S. government, and uh, it is something that the Secretary has placed significant, uh, significant emphasis on, both in um, the letter from uh, earlier in the month, the letter from April, but also the consistently at wi consistency at which the Secretary has raised humanitarian aid. Um, and the Secretary made very clear that there are continue, uh, continued areas where we need to see uh, market improvement. Improvement. Uh, Michelle, and then I'll come to you, Said. Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Does the U.S. still uh, consider the U.N. Security Council Resolution 1701 uh, as as is as the only solution for the war between Israel and uh, Hezbollah? Uh, we we certainly do, and when we, I know that there's been a lot of interest in 1701 over the past couple of days, and perhaps a little bit of uh, misunderstanding and in, in how. Uh, or misinterpretation uh, uh, in how it's being discussed. So let me just be unequivocally clear. We, what we want to see is the effective implementation of 1701. Uh, we think that it is vital uh, and it can help create the conditions that will ultimately allow civilians on both sides of the blue line uh, to return home. Uh, the secretary has been clear about that. I know, Michelle, you always like to ask about what Special Envoy Hochstein has been up to. It's something he has been uh, very clear about in his travels and in his engagements as well. The Secretary reiterated that with the Prime Minister, as you saw in the readout that um, uh, the travel team just put out, and it's something that we will continue to, to stress. Uh, ultimately,
ultimately what we want to see here is conditions that will allow civilians to be able to return home and beyond that get the uh, government and country of Lebanon to a place where it is uh, out of the stranglehold of Hezbollah and able to stand on its own two feet, be in a place where it can select a new president. All of these things ha we have been unequivocally um, consistent and clear about. But if the parties in the past, as Amos Sokstein said in Beirut, failed to implement the 1701, what will make them or will force them to implement it this time? So I, I'm just not going to speculate, uh, Michelle, on what might or might not happen. What I am offering you is what our perspective has been and what we think is a uh, credible and clear uh, solution uh, that is a step in the right direction. And we think that is the effective implementation of 1701. And finally, yeah. Congressman uh, Lahoud and Isa sent a letter to the president uh, asking them uh, to put pressure and uh, sanctions on the Speaker of the House, Nabi Berri, to elect a new president. Are you considering such uh, move? So certainly would not, uh, first, again, uh, just would not get into the details of our uh, congressional correspondence. We engage with members of both the House and Senate pretty regularly, and certainly I'm not in a place to preview or get into what actions we may or may not be considering. But when we talk about what we want to see for the future of Lebanon, uh, selecting a president is, of course, at the top of that list. We want to see a, uh, a president that is reflective of the will of the Lebanese people, and we want to see a government that is free from the stranglehold of of, of Hezbollah. Uh, Said, go ahead. Thank you, yeah. Bidan. Yeah. Now, Bidan, uh, from this podium, we heard some time back that if Sanwar was to depart the sea, the war would end. Now, I remember things akin to it would end tomorrow and so on. But what we have seen. I don't think we've I, ever. Okay. Said, I'm, I'm, I, so I, I, I always, I'm always happy to give you the space to ask whatever it is whatever questions that you want to ask. But I, I am going to just jump in and say that no one has ever said that. Uh, what, we, what we were talking about was that Mr. Sinwar had a choice to make as it relates to uh, the ceasefire proposal that had been on the table and that he time and time again chose not to accept what has been on the proposal. We never said that uh, if he were to die or be killed, that that all of a sudden would mean that the conflict uh, would end. What this means and what we said on Thursday and what the Secretary stressed in his meetings with Israeli counterparts today is that this is a new opportunity. Uh, his death is a new opportunity to uh, reinvigorate that conversation and work to get a ceasefire proposal, one that allows an influx of humanitarian aid into Gaza, one that brings the remaining hostages home, including the seven Americans, um, and, and get us on a path to diplomacy uh, that we hope will help get this region out of the endless cycles of violence. That's what this is about. Fair enough. Uh now, what we have seen since Sinawai's death is really an intensification of this assault. As a matter of fact, you know, it probably surpasses uh, other times. You know, the, Israel has always greeted uh, American officials, the Secretary, Secretary Blinken, with increased assault on Palestinians and so on. But we have seen really, I mean, a spike in killing dozens, hundreds of Palestinians since, since last Thursday when they announced the killing uh, of uh, Sinawai, even with some people calling for a resettlement. Uh, in Gaza and so on. So, uh, my question to you, is Israel implementing the so-called general's plan that, you know, aims to depopulate Gaza and resettle it by uh, Israeli settlers? Uh, what I can say, Said, is that First, um, the, the rhetoric that you're referring to about uh, resettling Gaza, or however it was phrased, we certainly, the, that's the kind of reject, ret rhetoric that we unequivocally reject. Uh, we have been um, clear an, uh, numerous times that what we are working towards and what we want to see is Palestinian-led governance in Gaza and a Gaza that is unified with the West Bank under what we hope is a revitalized Palestinian authority. Uh, the secretary was clear about this uh, in the immediate months after October 7th in a speech that he made in Tokyo that fall where he laid out that there can be no long-term displacement of Palestinians from Gaza. Uh, we don't want to see any territorial reduction in Gaza, and we certainly don't want to see any reoccupation of Gaza after this crisis ends. Uh, what we want to work on and what we want to see are um, affirmative elements that will get us to a sustained peace, and that in our view, needs to include uh, the Palestinians' people's voices, their aspirations, and that needs to be at the center of uh, post-crisis governance in Gaza. Uh, the United States would not and will not support anything less than that. Okay. 
Uh, uh, I also appreciate every time you call on me. I never. You know, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Palestinians have been accusing the Israeli military of using detainees uh, as human shields in Gaza. I wonder if you're aware of these reports and if you are doing anything uh, about it, uh, about investigating this issue. So uh, we've spoken to this a little bit before, Said. These reports are in incredibly disturbing, and if they are true, they are uh, completely unacceptable. We're still gathering information, uh, but as we have said before, uh, civilians need to be protected, uh, and Israel has a responsibility to investigate credible allegations of violations whenever they arise. And how will you determine if it's true or not? We will continue to engage with our partners in Israel on this side. Uh, of course, uh, as you we've talked about before, the United States does not have uh, uh, boots on the ground in Gaza. Uh, we will continue to assess these through the limited means that we have. But the ultimate thing here is that we want to see uh, Israel uh, appropriately investigate credible allegations uh, or violations whenever they arise. We have, of course, uh, seen them do that in uh, certain incidents. And and we want to make sure that that is consistently applied to anywhere uh, that these issues arise. Could we have an update on the delivery of aid from what I know? Sure, I'm happy to. I'm happy to offer um, uh, some updated uh, information on that. Look, I, I think first let me just say, and Jenny asked this a little bit, that this is something that the Secretary stressed and um, reiterated with the Prime Minister uh, earlier today, that we want to continue to see um, progress made. We are continuing to press Israel that uh, there is a responsibility to maximize and streamline uh, the existing crossings and open more crossings for more increased levels of aid into Gaza. Uh, 114 trucks uh, uh, crossed uh, yesterday. Uh, that included trucks from Karim Shalom, um, and the Era's West Crossing. Uh, certainly, I don't say that to try and make the point that that is satisfactory or enough, uh, but we want to continue to see a steady influx of, of trucks and humanitarian assistance uh, into Gaza site, especially as um, the region heads into the winter months. We want to make sure that appropriate foodstuffs and winterization supplies um, are appropriately surged. Thank you. Yeah. Alex, go ahead. Thank you. I want to yeah. go to uh, BRICS gathering sure. in Gaza. But before that, what did you make of the fact that UN Secretary General, who refused to attend Ukraine's peace summit, which is about defending the UN Charter, chose to somehow attend this Putin summit, which is about defying? So, uh, Alex, I, I will let the Secretary General and his team speak to uh, whatever scheduling decisions they uh, have or, or, or have not uh, made. I, I, I just want to be clear, though, Secretary General Guterres, um, I think, has the UN system in itself has been an incredible partner when we are talking about uh, holding uh, the Russian Federation accountable and making uh, in almost as unison as one can be in the UN system, making it clear that there is a strong collection of countries that um, are standing up against uh, Russian aggression, Russian's territorial, uh, uh, its infringement on Ukrainian territorial integrity, its infringement on Ukrainian sovereignty. So I, let me just first uh, uh, address that as it relates to the Secretary General. General. Uh, on the BRICS um, summit broadly, Alex, uh, we believe all countries are, are sovereign countries and they um, have their own choice and make their own choices about the countries and groupings in which that they uh, associate. What the United States is focused on and the approach that we bring to all of the foreign policy and the diplomacy that we conduct is that we are focused on working with uh, partners around the world to build the broadest and deepest uh, coalitions possible to help achieve our shared goals. Uh, we want to enhance the value proposition of what the United States can bring to the table. And we want to work with countries through investments in the kinds of things that we know these kinds of countries are looking for. And we are looking to sharpen and deepen and broaden our partnerships in that way. And of course, um, uh, the multilateral institutions, whether it be the UN, G20, um, uh, groups, groupings like APEC or ASEAN are, of course, uh, important and vital avenues for us to do that. And that's why you have seen the secretary place an emphasis on continuing to engage with those countries. And look, as it relates to the specific makeup of, of BRICS, uh, we're going to continue to work and have a strong, positive relationship with Brazil, with South Africa, with
with India. We work bilaterally with those countries in a number of key areas, uh, a number of key areas that we frankly think are going to continue to define the 21st century. Uh, when it comes to China, our uh, goal and our intent is to continue to manage that relationship and manage that relationship responsibly, uh, manage our competition with China responsibly. That is what we know that the rest of the world expects of superpowers. Uh, and lastly, as it relates to Russia, we will continue to push back on Russian aggression and make clear to any country on the planet that it can no longer be business as usual uh, with the Russian Federation. As you know, there's some newcomers in the room. You know, Azerbaijan is one of the Kazakhstan was punished for not uh, joining. Uh, but Turkey, you know, Turkish president is among the participants. Does the department have any view of uh, your NATO partners uh, BRICS membership bid? No, this is a this is a this is an issue for uh, our Turkish partners to speak to. Turkey is an important and vital uh, NATO ally, and as I said at the beginning, um, we believe that countries uh, are able to to chart their own foreign policy and choose whatever countries and groupings uh, in which they associate. And finally, but for me, uh, uh, speak of Turkey. Turkish Parliament today, uh, the government uh, has reintroduced uh, a law called "quote unquote" agent of influence. We said another copycat of you know Russian foreign influence law, foreign agent law. Do you have any position? Uh, I'm not very familiar with that, Alex, but I'm happy to check with the team and see if we can get something back for you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Pakistani Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif has uh, um, made an appeal to President Biden for the release of Dr. Afshar Siddiqui, who is in U.S. prison for attempting to kill American officials in Afghanistan. How would you respond to that request? So uh, first, I, I certainly wouldn't get into private diplomatic uh, communications. And uh, on the case itself, I would refer to the Department of Justice to speak to any inquiries regarding um, Dr. Siddiqui's incarceration. Sure. Uh, police in southern Pakistan have shot that a doctor accused of blasphemy. And it's not just killing. After he was killed, a uh, violent mob dragged out his dead body from a car had burnt it to death in front of his family. Um, how much are you concerned about the rise of religious extremism in, extremism in Pakistan? We uniformly oppose blasphemy laws everywhere in the world, and that, of course, includes in Pakistan. We believe that these laws jeopardize the exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of expression and the freedom of religion or belief. Uh, we regularly raise these concerns with um, uh, countries around the world, including, of, of, of course, Pakistan. Uh, so last question. Um, Media reports suggest that the United States has uh, communicated to the Indian government that it seeks meaningful accountability regarding the alleged murder plot of a Sikh activist in New York. Could you confirm if th that kind of message sent to India? What would their response? So, uh, to take a step back, there was valuable engagement with India's inquiry committee last week, and information was exchanged uh, between our two governments uh, to further our respective investigations. Uh, we understand that the Indian inquiry committee will continue its investigation, and we expect to see further steps uh, based on last week's conversations. Uh, we continue to expect and want to see accountability based on the results of that investigation, and certainly the United States won't be fully satisfied until there is meaningful accountability uh, resulting from that investigation. Uh, beyond that, I'm just not going to uh, address this in further detail, given that this is an issue that is uh, active and remains under investigation and ongoing under both of our countries. Go ahead. Thank you very much for that. Just yeah. two questions, sir. Uh, <clears throat> today, this one senator uh, resigned from Pakistan Senate. Uh, he was on dialysis and he said that while he was picked up by the powerful, usually by the powerful, they mean the establishment, the military of Pakistan. He said while he was picked up, he was given dialysis even twice during that five, six days time. Uh, do you have anything to say? Are you even aware about it? Uh, I'm not aware and I really don't have anything to, to offer on that. Uh, Jackson, just one more question. Thanks, but, no, just gonna, one you got two yesterday. Go ahead, Okay, Jackson. thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Vedant. Uh, uh, there's a report that Ariane Tabatabi was the leaker of the documents purporting to show Israel's plans to retaliate against Iran. Can you confirm? Uh, I certainly wouldn't speak to that from here. As I said in a response to Nick's question earlier, the FBI has uh, announced that they are um, actively investigating the uh, unauthorized disclosure, and I will uh, ultimately defer to them to speak to that further. Uh, did the secretary discuss the leaks during his visit to Israel? I, I don't have anything uh, else to offer as it relates to uh, the secretary's engagements beyond what was in the readout. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
When it comes to Intel analysis, South Korea and the United States have been very uh, in lockstep and very close coordination, uh, especially about uh, North Korea's military activities. And this time, th there seems to be some difference. And you said it's, it's not about confidence in South Korean intelligence. Then are you um, rejecting the notion that there is a discrepancy in Intel analysis between Seoul and Washington so about North Korean deployment? I, I'm just not going to speak to the process, uh, the, the intelligence processes that we have in place. Uh, let me just be unequivocal about this. Uh, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, when it comes to our priorities around the world, um, uh, our relationship with the Republic of Korea is one of the most vital and one of our uh, most consequential and Im important relationships. They are a partner in a number of key areas, especially when it comes to our broader and ultimate goal of seeing peace and stability across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, our, our partners in Korea uh, are integral to that goal. Um, uh, Separate from that, the reporting that we have seen as it relates to soldiers from the DPRK, who uh, the, the suggestion that they have been sent to fight alongside Russian uh, forces in Ukraine, uh, should that be true, that would be incredibly concerning, it would be dangerous, and certainly it would be reckless. Uh, the United States has its own processes in place and our own assessments that we need to make uh, before certainly we can publicly um, uh, say that we are seeing anything as it relates to a particular policy area. It is not at all a reflection of um, any country, whether it be uh, the ROK or otherwise. It's not a reflection of that at all. Any discussions underway as to what to do in terms of, you know, like, like sanctioning North Korea or Look, any steps I, to take? At, at, the center, at the center of this, uh, if these developments are true, they would certainly be incredibly dangerous. And that is why at the core of this is continuing to consult with our allies and partners, of which um, uh, ROK would certainly be a part of that, but I, I, I'm not going to uh, preview any um, uh, preview any actions we may or may not take. From Thank you. Um, go ahead. Um, do you know how many aid trucks arrived in northern Gaza over the weekend up until today? Uh, I don't have a specific breakdown for you on uh, uh, transit intra Gaza. What I can say is what I asked answered to Saeed's question is that um, there were, and I will pull up the number again just to be. Uh, precise, it was um, on October 21st, 114 trucks uh, that we saw enter Gaza, which again, I'm not at all, don't make that, offer that statistic to say that that is satisfactory, but that is uh, the, the updated metric that we have. And simultaneously, we of course are stressing with partners in Israel that more needs to be done to enhance the flow of humanitarian aid. I, I asked because um, a journalist yesterday on the ground in, in, nor in northern Gaza uh, yesterday he told me that an UNRWA facility in Gaza City had received seven trucks uh, containing flour and canned goods but which have yet to be distributed but received no water I don't know what you do with flour without water um, but uh, uh, you know they're having a hard time even distributing these because of the ongoing so onslaught there. I, I, so. I'm just going to stop you right there. We um, we are not at all saying that the situation has improved or that the situation is satisfactory. Far from it. Uh, we have in the immediate days following the letter that Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin sent, we saw some important steps in the right direction as it relates to particular border crossings. Uh, those were good positive signs. Uh, I can say that on October 21st, 114 uh, trucks made its way into Gaza. But of course, we are continuing to see challenges. Uh, as it relates to ensuring that aid uh, is getting to where it needs to go within Gaza. That's something that we are continuing to work closely on with uh, partners in Israel, NGO partners, and international organizations. And that's something we'll continue to stress. Okay. All right, everyone, we're going to wrap there. Thanks.